years of uh, what's happening at the former Union Station and what we're calling uh, the Renaissance District in downtown South Bend, and that is uh, Kevin Smith and Willow Weatherall. So please help me welcome them. Periodically, I get uh, kind of excited about what I do because I've been doing it a while, and, and I guess I truly will admit that uh, uh, sustainability or energy management and I go back uh, about 47 years, actually. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that just so you can see that it can start in any number of ways. And, and I believe anybody can have a profound impact once you kind of know how to plug in, how to make a difference. And, and hopefully, if nothing else, that's what is left with you guys. Say, look, you can do, you can make a difference. Yes, you're going to have to study, you're going to have to learn, but don't sit back, step forward, and, and make a difference. Uh, so that's my, that's, that's my one single goal. Uh, and, and Willow has been working with us now for how long? It's been a while. Yeah, two and a half years. And um, my background is actually in international peace studies. Um, and basically, I studied how post conflict societies were built. And uh, when I had children, I had to figure out how to pivot and translate those skills to a local context because I was no longer going to travel to the first places. <laughs> and it turns out that South Bend mirrors a post conflict society um, quite well. And so I'm really grateful for the ability to take peace building skills, translate them into community development, economic development, and um, translate some economic and social benefit to the the area around Mr. Baker um, redevelopment project. So that's kind of how I you know, fit into the equation here. So. Uh, just a brief bio, I guess. Uh, I'll try to be brief. That's what we but, so, so my background is a uh, real uh, in construction working environment. My father started a, a sheet metal business uh, 46 years ago. Garage, and I was the youngest and ergo the dumbest, and so I was his partner. Uh, so by the way, we still have it, or I still have it, it's still like sheet metal, so we've been operating it for, for that amount of time. Uh, and that's kind of how I got introduced into the system. In fact, when I was in high school, for the Enos map, they built, a, they had the paper at that point, they built a sustainable house. It was a rock, solar collector rock system. So I was intrigued by it, so I, I installed it and studied it. And it was kind of fun because the engineer that uh, designed it, I studied it really quite a bit. And so I put it all in. He finally asked when people came to work it, would you mind telling them how to work it? Uh, but it was kind of fun because I got to move the air through a huge stone chimney. So the stone was just to uh, they absorb the thermal and then reduce or uh, let it go over time. So, so that's kind of how I started and it. Uh, the nice thing about it is through the sheet metal or through the construction trades, I was able to really understand how to make things work, how to move air, what to do, how to work. Uh, it also allowed me to pay my way through uh, another day, which I studied psychophysiology. Um, so I did artificial intelligence stuff. So, and sheet metal, you can imagine the, the talks that uh, break when I work in sheet metal. Uh, so that was my background, then I moved into, uh, I did some software development, and eventually bought the Union Station uh, back in 1979, and so that's when I started learning how to adapt buildings, and then the telecommunication industry, because of the railroad, came through, and uh, one thing led to another, and I became good at the telecommunications, so now we're one of the second largest telecommunications hub in the state. So we bring technology to our community. And so then we've tried to always apply that technology to energy. Um, what we did is Notre Dame and supercomputers, that hasn't changed. It started changing in early 2000, where they had independent computers. We started activating them, putting them into one environment. And uh, I got very good at collecting translating the electrical energy that ran the computers, translated it into thermal energy. And so what, because it was just more, more energy efficient to do it that way, because then if I had to reject it, 
the high value of the temperature of the, uh, I was able to raise the output temperature from 70 degrees to about 90, 90 degrees, and so I could more efficiently reject the heat, which takes a lot of energy from the have mechanical cooler. So I ended up patenting a couple things that the global energy operating system and then a combined power system. So if anybody cares, I'm happy to talk about it, but uh, I won't unless somebody asks. But the key thing behind that is that it became clear to me as computers matured, we went from an industrial age to computer age. And we think computers are benign. They are, except they consume 7% of our energy source right now. And we know that energy or the computing is just an ascendancy. So it became clear to me that if we really want to be sustainable, we want to manage our energy well, we really have to be thinking. We have to figure out how do we optimize energy, how do we make sure the computers are working efficiently. It's kind of sad in a way. Right now, the computers, the throughput on computers is an average between 5 to 10 percent of the capacity of the computer is currently used. And so you have all these this heat being produced to have an idle, and that's how computers are used today. Uh, is there anybody here that left their car running by the came in? Every computer is left running idle. And so those are the things that I'm trying to change, and I'm working with some people right now to say, that doesn't make any logical sense. And uh, so the other thing that I ended up doing, is you see the building, the Renaissance District, it's on the wrong side of the tracks, because it is. The, the train actually uh, bisected our community, and there was the right side of the tracks and the wrong side of the tracks. The bad thing is I knew it was on the wrong side of the tracks when I bought it. Uh, but I bought it on, on, on purpose, two reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is I thought Studebaker did a great deal to transform our community. And I thought, God, yes, it did. It failed, and it, it created some hardship for people. But I also felt that it did a lot to, to create our community, and I felt it needed to be lifted up. So as such, remember the 50th, on the 50th anniversary of their, their shutting down. So we threw a party. And everybody said I was crazy, but you have to admit that was probably one of the best events because everybody that loves Studebaker came out and was so thankful because they finally got recognized for a company that, that was meant a great deal to them. And they never felt that they could. So it was about to take this, this iconic failure and transform it into what we hope to be an iconic success to show that we live in a very innovative space. If you use technology, use hard work, you can transform it. So remember I was telling you about the thermal exchange and the computer. Well, this building is just a small little building, 880,000 square feet, was built in the industrial age. Uh, they have concrete on the perimeter, so it's a port place concrete. Remember I told you about the, the thermal um, rock uh, storage system? Well, concrete conveys en energy in and out, right? So when you see all the concrete, all that concrete conveys all the exterior full inside. Back in the day, they didn't care because they didn't, in the industrial age, you just stoked it with a little bit more coal or whatever, and you never even thought of it. So today's standards, it, it, it doesn't work. So we reinventing the how the facade, the, the shell of the building works so it works more efficiently. But what I've decided to do is that if you have all this surplus heat, so we know computers are just getting bigger and actually hotter. So I captured the heat in the water and I'm heating the entire building with the waste heat from the computer. Now that so what's kind of fun and whoever wants to do a project, unfortunately I am wildly busy is Understate. I know mathematically I'm better than Google, but I don't have the time to prove it because I get credited for the secondary energy flow that they always put their equipment where there is no other secondary energy flow. 
So what we've done is studied that whole energy equation and said, why don't we use it as effectively as possible? And the conclusion became very clear that you have to have disproportionate or dis disparate use of energy. And so the fact that we put a, a data center, which is on the other side of the tracks, feeding this building and heating the building, it does several really interesting things. We have very efficient heating and cooling because when you we have three megawatts. Uh, downtown is about 18 megawatts. Uh, so eventually the building will be about an 80 megawatt center. So the, one this whole complex will be 80 megawatts. That would be Notre Dame, downtown, Notre Dame, downtown, and one more, more downtown. That's how much power concentration computing consumes. So you have to get very good at understanding power and maneuvering power around. So I saw that as a fantastic opportunity to put it in a mixed-use environment so that this, the secondary energy could be reused. So, so that kind of shows where we are or where we're going. Um, I'll walk you quickly through some other components, then I'd like to come back and try to tie in the social portion of sustainability. And because the truth of the matter, it isn't all about energy. Energy is important, but it is the human energy is just as important as the electrical mechanical energy. And you have to figure out uh, an ecosystem where we tie those together. And so obviously, you guys are the human energy. So hopefully, we'll get to integrate it into the whole process. Um, in, in the 2000s, I uh, designed and built this building. Uh, it's for it's kind of a fancy sheet metal shop, don't you guys think? But in fact, I think I'm thinking it's one of the fancy sheet metal shops in the country. But I'm biased. I grew up in sheet metal, so when I built a brand new sheet metal shop, I thought we ought to build a really nice and new sheet metal. But here's a great example about being thoughtful about energy and energy flow. Those, that pond, and the, there's some, some ponds up there, reflection ponds, those are my cooling towers. They're not ponds, they're cooling towers. I use geothermal, I, I created a, a pond, that I don't think we'll be able to see it, but there's a pond further down that I pull the water out of it, and I use 80% of my cooling in the summer in geothermal, I oversized oil. I have, frankly, it'll cool probably about 90% of the time I use mechanical cooling for the education only. And so then I use what, what's been given to me. And that pond, by the way, uh, captures all the water from the tow road for two miles. And so I have reorganized it, created wear, I filtered it, I put the right berms in, and I knew nothing of it when I started, by the way. I wish I had classes, but you know, now, in that old time, they didn't have these classes, right? But now you have Googles, you know, you need help. So literally, that's what I did. Never built a pond before, but I figured it out. And so what we did is we, we cleansed the water that was coming from the tow road. It was just uh, running through, actually, it, 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 it created huge rocks. And so we just captured it, put it in a weir, and then we filtered it and we opened it up. Then by, by using the water from the, the aquifer, we use it for cooling. We, we cooled it back down through a series of ponds and then reintroduced it. What that did is create oxygen for the ponds, and it, it changed that ecosystem within the pond. So it, it made it more, more vibrant and it cleaned up the water. And then I had it designed so that as it elevated, it, it would filtrate through a sand bed and then back into the aquifer. So it's an open exchange system. The other thing that what we did, or I did, was that there's a, it's a laminar flow, so that means that the, the, the wind just flows smoothly without turbulating. And so you, if you ever go by, you can almost see at the top there's a cube flow. And so does, do you guys know about a Venturi effect? So the Venturi effect just means, so I, I created the cupola, so I accumulated the air because when I was on my dozer, because I did that, 
It was windy all the time. I could never figure it out. Finally figured out, they cut in the tow road. It's right on the tow road. So it created a natural window. So I'm going, I got sandblasted all the time I was doing it. So I said, fine. I engineered around the reality. So I curved the road, the road I tipped it, and I created a, a venturi effect on the top. You'll see a little cupola. It has optical uh, dampers. and allows the wind to flow through, and that creates a vacuum. As you accelerate it, it'll create a negative force, and it'll create a vacuum. And I put embedded earthen wells on the other side, so that's how I cool my, my big part of my shop. I use I use nature, or I use the natural energy flowing around us to, to do work for me. And you can see quite a bit of glass. We have natural light, and so that way it diminished how much light I had to do. The upper bands are, are clear, and I designed the canopy or the roof structure based on the solar, where the sun was going to be, and so I put highly reflective glass when, when in the summer it would reflect it all, and in the winter it actually becomes a passive solar collector because there's an atrium inside, and that atrium collects the solar, and then I just pick it up and distribute it throughout the shop. But again, it doesn't cost me anything. And, and these are ways that if you're just thoughtful, and you think about the problem, you can adapt to the energy that is flowing in and around you in a, in a very simple, pragmatic way. That passive solar, it took me a little bit of design time, but beyond that, it's it's a forever solar benefit to, to this, this particular building. And I, I, I won't, I could, but I, I, I promised I wouldn't. The, the floors, I use radiant floor heat, so that way you, you put the heat where the people are. And, and so if you guys just stop and think, what is the purpose of that energy? What's the most effective way to utilize energy? I think everybody has that responsibility. If you're going to use energy, think about it. Understand what you're going to do with it. Understand what nature intended, what other energies are flowing around, and figure out how to capture it. So I'm curious to see what people's thoughts about it. But And you can see even in the shop area, so I use natural lights. So I have windows all the way through. On the west side, I put an earthen embankment because that's the dominant wind area. And by tipping it, then I minimized how much wind load was on it and how much uh, uh, heat would be pulled away because of the wind. So, so those are just by just sitting down and doing careful thinking, you can have a, per, a profound effect. My costs operate the building on the energy side is frankly one third of the traditional kind of building. So this was just one of the things. I did this in 2000. So I'm a little committed to trying to be as energy efficient as possible. Uh, this was just to try to articulate you have 7,000 or 7%, excuse me, of energy. So I'll, I'll, let me pause because uh, how am I making sense to you guys? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, so because help me, if I, uh, I, we could talk about all kinds of things, but I, I, it's not important. I want to make sure that it's relevant to you guys. So uh, throw things, not really heavy hard things, but throw things if, if, if I'm not connecting, okay? Because I do appreciate it, because I'm here to help you in any way I, I, I can. So this is, this is the, this is the transition what we see to the left is the failed ecosystem of the industrial world. We consume more energy when, before the industrial age, our ecosystem was working pretty well. In sustainability, our ecosystem actually worked for, well, 3.5 billion years. So it, it, it kind of knows what it's doing, right? And then when we introduced the industrial age, we figured out how to transform and pull energy off and mechanically make it do work for us without any understanding at that point. I'm hoping just that we didn't understand it and that we didn't know we were disrupting the ecosystem. So our objective at the district is say, look, that's not okay. We gotta put it back in balance. You can't 
take and take time and roll backwards. But we surely can change how we use it now. And so what we'll try to do is as quickly as we can walk you through some of these initiatives and how we feel it's going to have a transformational impact. And what we try to do is solve problems in a way that they're repeatable and make them publishable to people so we inspire other people to do it. I don't care if it's at your own house or if it's a two million square foot facility. Fantastic. I'm even better. And but we are we're having a fully integrated at all from the about two million square feet of a combined campus energy system where the energy on the forefront of the uh, lower right is the union station. That energy will exchange uh, back into the student baker building and vice versa, where, wherever the energy needs to flow or flow to create an optimal energy flow. We have to put in appropriate sensors and building automation systems. And you, you have to design it in a way which we did is that there's an energy back lane that's disassociated from input energy and from energy consumed. That allows you to pull and pull, push and pull energy in and out wherever you need it. And if anybody wants to talk about a variable refrigerant, uh, I'm happy to, but I won't unless we're given the required for ask. But it does allow us, that's what I've used inside, and it allows a very efficient thermal exchange within uh, different zones. So if you have cooling in one zone, that, that heat that's a byproduct becomes heat as a product. And so we are, we're able to balance energy within the building. The input energy is coming from the computing. And so we really are trying to be cognitive about how we use energy. Um, this gives you a sense of the, the campus. Um, we, we've looked at putting some sort of cover over the building and having a, a green uh, courtyard in, in the middle. We've looked at even actually closing it. Um, the parking, we're, what we found, and I've worked with ASG, we'll give you a short clip on, he did a presentation at Notre Dame just a few weeks ago. He, I, I hired him because of his parametric methodology uh, means that he looks at the engineering portion of it as well as the, the static and architectural and looks to integrate it. And that's how I like to look at things. So it, it's been a very uh, productive uh, engagement with him. So we are, we're going to have about three acres, well actually probably about five acres of green wall. Because, and I told him my goal, I, I'll, I'll get as close as I can. My goal was to him, I said, look, when Google takes a picture directly over, ideally I don't want you to see a building. So the rule, the design rule is if you displace Earth, you have to replace it on top. And so that way you, you are working in, in balance with nature. You're displacing it. Fine. People need to live someplace. We need to do we need space, but that doesn't mean you have to be rude to to nature, right? So you displace it. You put it back in there. I, I've done some really very innovative things. Uh, so you, you see this green. So I, I've, I've invented carbon dioxide modifiers. Great invention. I, mean, I thought it was pretty cool. So why do you do it? Well, I would use oxygen sensors instead of just mandating that you exchange 10% of the air with the outside when it's nice like it is or minus 10 degrees and I have to pay all the thermal to heat it back up. I said, that doesn't make sense. What if we actually use green trees that do that kind of thing for you, and what if we actually created an environment where they claim our own air? Because the other thing they do is they respire, right? They, and so that becomes my humidifier. So you're looking at how I, how I change as much as I can. I, I improve the purity of air by actually using nature. So don't underestimate the value of nature in a controlled way, because it humidifies. So what's your other choice of humidification? I'll take water in 
uh, heat it up until it evaporates, right? And what I love this in data centers, they, they do it in such an elegant way. They will flood the water in the data center, they'll heat it up so it evaporates, and then they cool it down because they have to keep it cool. And so then a part of the water condenses back out, and then they just keep repeating it. And, and so what I decided that I'm not going to do that. So in data center, we use uh, ionized water, and we use it under high pressure. And we, so what happens, it does two things. It creates a fire suppression system, but it atomizes it. So when that high pressure water goes, it evaporates immediately. When, when you change state to, from liquid to air, you actually absorb heat. So instead of consuming heat to, to humidify, actually reduce heat. So those are the sort of things that uh, physics is a, your friend, by the way. If you understand change of state, learn change of state. If you want to know, if you want to help the environment, learn change of state, because that's where that's where the work, real work is done. That's my good really opinion. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're creating, this is a courtyard, uh, the thing to the right is, is, is my concoction. Uh, so I'll, I'll take credit or blame for it. But that's about a 235 uh, person auditorium. And so what we're doing is creating a technology center where some of the more challenging problems uh, can actually, people can come and have a computing connectivity and even some data visualization tools so we can address uh, some pretty significant problems because they need to be addressed. We're trying to create that kind of ecosystem where it's called an International Thought Institute for the gravy for this to occur here. Um, and that will be looking at the facade uh, at the end of it. Um, if somebody's interested, I can tell you the, the process we went through to redesign the scan. It's on the north side. And, uh, so if you can't tell, I, I kind of I have some passion about it. But the real passion isn't about buildings. It isn't even about energy. It's about inspiring the human energy to change the world, realistically. And, and that's what it's about. It's about creating an ecosystem. And, and with Willow and the whole team, we're, we're really working at doing that. And these are some examples. This is so what's kind of interesting. You see that nice shiny floor? It's concrete. So I hired developers and I started to. And so they go, who got what car for that? Why don't we grind it? So I, I ground the original floor. It's only it's it's only 12 inches thick, so it may wear out in a couple more thousand years or so. But so we we use what we have. We have wood smith. So we we took the wood floor off of they use wood, uh, and we're making furniture out of it. So everybody else would throw it away. I said that doesn't make sense. It's great wood. We figured out how to saw it up, and and so those are the kind of things that. With just the right kind of thinking, uh, you, you can do it. It doesn't matter. The, the last is I'm, I'm recruiting. Is that is that permissible? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, the, and then I'm going to get back on the social side, but this was, uh, this is classic. So, it, it was an old factory, so it had environmental issues, right? Which I knew it, and so we worked through it. So I had to put a parking lot in. I had to have it in before winter, and I was allowed environmentally to start October 15th. Okay. Well, all the asphalt plants closed on Thanksgiving. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I can do it, but by gosh, I was going to do it. Started digging, and then we found out in about, uh, it was 1944, they dismantled. They dismantled. Uh, get your head wrapped around it. And, was a war time. They dismantled the buildings to make room for parking lot. They hand stacked the bricks in the basement of these buildings that they didn't want to. Because I'm like, how did they do that? I'm digging it out. I'm like, how did that happen? And it finally dawned on me that's what they did. So during the war, they dismantled it, and then they had a central power plant, and they stripped out all the steel. But back then it made sense. At first, I couldn't envision why they could do it. 
So what I found, instead of dirt, which I really needed, I had 10 feet of brick, three acres of brick. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I, this wasn't a good day, by the way, because I'm like, no, tell me this isn't. And I, I thought it was only one place. So I go dig another hole. And, and really, we have some, some videos of it. it. It has to be hilarious. It wasn't hilarious at the time, because I'm like, what are we going to do? This is tainted soil. I can't take it away. I can't finish. I don't know what to do with it, right? So ironically, as I was mentioning to her, one of the EPA, and I'm not, I'm not it was permissible. I, I couldn't do it because it wasn't. It was permissible for an a, a, e, EPA to put what they call the pervious pavers in, right? So you dissipate the water and it gets absorbed through all the bad soils. So it, it leaches all the way through the bad soils and finds its way to the aquifer. And I, I'm going, how does this make sense? But they said, well, it'll take years, but it'll eventually all the bad stuff would get into the water. I said, well, I, I couldn't do it, to be honest. So I dug it all up. I screened it. So I power screened it so the dirt got pulled off, and then the, the concrete and the bricks. And then what I did is I brought in a crusher, and then all of that waste became my 53s and number twos for my bed for my girls. I never had to bring it in. So I literally reprocessed everything on site. It was wildly painful, and we're still finishing. If anybody wants to witness the pain, you can go there and see piles. And you see huge piles, by the way. You have to remember that all came out of the ground. But this is where you can choose to either give up or think about it. And so what I ended up doing is I found out a guy who could come and rent the machines and crush them and repurpose it and never take it off site, which that the EPA. I put big trench drains in, so I dug down until I got the sugar sand to indigenous soil, because I, and I, I integrated them all into one. So that way, and I'm using the old tunnels for water retention. So now, I, once I discovered the good tunnels, I decided that I would harvest the rainwater. Here's a concept, right? So I decided, well, that's stupid. Why would I have it go back into the river so it gets, it gets taken off, and then I pay somebody 10 miles away to pump it up, right? Because I got cooling towers for data centers. You have a lot of need for water, for evaporation. So you pay somebody to pull it up, put chemicals in it, you leave it in the ground so it gets calcified and hard and problematic, and then you pay to pump it all the way to you. Then you have to put more chemicals in it to sustain, to suspend the hard water. And then you evaporate uh, maybe 60, 70 percent of it until you get too big a concentration. And then you waste it. And I said, "Wow, that seems like a lot of work. What if I did something now and I put a collection basin system in it and I collected the water, stored it in the tunnels, and used the soft water that has been, you know, evaporated and, and rained down on me? So that's what we're doing." And, and those are the sort of things that uh, you guys can surely figure out how to do. And, and, and the more you can do, you can help other people successfully implement those logical, s simple systems, frankly. And so there again, uh, I think it's going to work out quite well. Uh, if I, I, I will store, I do not feel that I'll have to Grant uh, back into the bottom for if I do, I made a big enough system, and if I did, I feel personally comfortable that there will be no contaminants because my collection basin has a, a settling pond or component to it, so all the, all the solids are settled out. So these are all the people, and, and this is, and see, so you're like, wow, you get rid of so the good news, <laughs> yes, there you go. So help them understand because this is people's sustainability while we're making the world a better place, right? That's right. Well, this particular image um, is from Earth Day 2015, and um, so my work on the project started about two and a half years, two and a half years ago. And uh, unfortunately, when I first started, it was when the environmental remediation was ongoing. 
And um, we had to get a little bit creative about what community engagement looked like because we really weren't ready to open the building up and you know see prospective tenants and pour people through it. So, um, but one of the things that um, so you'll you'll notice like I think in very different terms than Kevin, and he is a brilliant thinker, um, thought leader, visionary in so many ways. The way I think is in terms of human relationships. Everything gets done through relationships. And um, and also, I think a lot about how to tell the story of the development project. Um, we talk a lot about the continuity of innovation, Studebaker's legacy, and then the adaptive reuse of this historic building to provide a platform um, for a new industry to grow in South Bend and for people to be able to start their own business, have access to power and connectivity, but also to attract um, talent into that ecosystem so that people can share ideas, you know, grow and um, take an idea and bring it to fruition. So um, part of part of uh, what I get to do is make sure that the, the story is sort of alive and well in our community and that people know um, what we're doing. And one of the one of the large projects we did was an Earth Day Impact Day. Um, we have a partnership with The Crossing, which is an educational, um, it's an alternative high school for struggling students. And one thing that I should back up and say, can I back up a little bit? This development project, um, just so that I kind of anchor you geographically, um, so if you're familiar with downtown South Bend, this development project is just south of downtown. Has anybody gone to a ball game at Forwards Fields? So this is the this is the building that sort of dominates the southern portion of downtown. And, um, but what's interesting about it, even though there's an incredible amount of investment that's gone into this facility, into Portland's Field, into South Pleasant Commission Park, it also has a very high concentration of social services. So when Kevin talked about this project being on the wrong side of the tracks, well, in this neighborhood, we have two, um, two homeless shelters, a high school, uh, or excuse me, alternative high school for struggling students, um, large food country, um, We've got the county jail that's right behind this project. And really the only residential units in the district are a large public housing um, project. So we've got a lot of economic and social need right around it. And what I think is really interesting is two things. One is to take what seemed like liabilities and turn them into opportunities. And, um, and also figure out in an ecosystem how really how do we lift everybody up because it's not just about the technology and the innovation that's going into this into the building, but it's looking at 80, this 80 city blocks around the building and figuring out how those components fit together as well. So um, the when we talk about the Renaissance District, um, we, we are starting to, to look outside these boundaries, but um, right now it's the Croc Center at Chapin um, on the west side of town to Michigan on our east and then uh, Western is our northern border and then San Jose to the south of us. But actually as we're studying ecosystems and human relationships and how people move in and out of the district, those those boundaries are becoming, you know, words, more, more, more fluid. Um, and also just a quick question, how many people are familiar with Studebaker? Anybody here not really know? I am not from South Bend. I've been here almost 17 years and I've really come to to love like the the, um, the story of Studebaker and how it built South Bend, but it was new to me moving here from the East Coast. And um, what's I think what's interesting when you look at, for example, this image of this sprawling industrial complex. This um, was really an economic driver for the city of South Bend. And at one time, in normal production, employed 25,000 people. In wartime production during World War II, it went up to 35,000. And we're not going to see that type of industry come back. You're not going to see those kind of single employers, you know, who between the jobs at Studebaker and then all of the support industry around it, that was a huge percentage of the town was dependent <coughs> on this company. And what we're developing with the what's remaining of the Studebaker um, facilities. It's a platform for other companies to come in and be successful. Kevin is a serial entrepreneur. I think it's maybe 14? Just 13. 13 companies at present. I and, 
And people, people often ask, well, are you going to have this in the building or are you going to have that in the building? Well, yes, we'll have it if somebody wants it. We're not looking to, to do you know, all of the businesses. We're providing an opportunity for others to come in to be innovative and you know, launch and be successful. And what's, so just, um, just to give a sense, so this is 120 acres of Studebaker covered, and see how it's remaining um, three buildings close to downtown, and there's one a little bit further south. The rest have been raised, and that's where Ignition Park is now. Um, so even though it's a large development project over a million square feet of space that's being, you know, it's a small fraction of what used to exist. One of the things that Kevin mentioned about the power infrastructure, when we talk about like Studebaker's legacy, what we have there, even though a lot of the facility was, was taken down, we do have power infrastructure that we can draw on now as, a, as an asset and resource to this project. Um, let's see. To, um, and then just quickly, I wanted to I wanted to mention so like how you know Kevin talked a lot about the technical components of adaptive reuse and a little bit about the environmental remediation, but there are facilities and buildings like this all across the U.S. that are often in really prime locations. They're close to downtowns or close to urban waterways and rivers and canals. And you know the kind of processes that happen in these buildings. There, there are things. There is environmental cleanup that needs to happen. And we talk about um, adapting and reusing a building and bringing it back to productive use. So this was the state's largest lead remediation project in its history. When I came on, when I came on board, the lead remediation was just, you know, was just starting. And I think it was three, three crews working on the clock for about nine months um, to clean the building. But so you can see some some before and after pictures. Um, of, you know, you see the concrete columns. But um, once once the areas were clean, it was a beautiful, beautiful clean slate to work from. So you got that exposed brick. I mean, the concrete. Uh, you know, looks. I mean, aside from um, you know places in the floor where the concrete you know needed some repair work, it was really in great shape. And we really have tried, like, in the renovation of the building to retain that industrial aesthetic, as Kevin mentioned, retaining as much of the look and feel of the building, but just updating it for, for modern use. Um, and what, one of the things, I, I, I'm going to change the presentation to show it better, but when I take people on tours of the building, when we ground down that concrete, there is beautiful aggregate. And they don't make, they don't even make, they don't make buildings like this anymore, they don't make concrete like that anymore. So you get to see beautiful, beautiful stone, um, and so ground down and polish it. Just, it came out really, really beautifully. Just leaving the columns in place. Um, Kevin has worked in a really innovative, you know, lighting system for the building. Because uh, you have to think about, this is huge manufacturing space. How do you partition it up to allow multiple tech companies to exist in the space and still make sure that everyone has access to natural light and that feeling of expansiveness in the building? So it's been, I mean, it's been wonderful to figure out, you know, pairing what is beautiful about the building. This building was designed by um, Alfred Kahn, who's a famous industrial architect. So it may it may look like a simple building, but it's it really is it's a historical treasure. Um, so just these are some of the some of the um, photos, of, you know, just work building building the mezzanine um, for our first for our first tenants. Um, you saw maybe in this past uh, image these large trenches, all of the mechanicals we cut into the concrete floor, put the red mechanicals underneath to preserve the headspace so that when our tenants come in, they can have access to extra square footage. Yes, so. And another purpose behind that is now it's future proof. So if there's a better energy <coughs> system, that you just lift the lids up. So by creating an energy backplane, I'm anticipating somebody getting wiser and finding a better input energy source. It doesn't matter, you just plug it into the entire building and it's distributed automatically throughout the building. So those are the sort of thoughtful things that you need to do because I don't know what the power density is going to be for computers. I don't know if it's going to be uh, printers, you know, 3D printers or whatever. So literally we engineered it to be as little power density or as much as required and we provide a pass for that. Another quick thing that I, I think is important, had you torn this building down 
think how much energy it would require to tear it down, break it up, move it up, and then move and build, bring all the material back to get to the same spot you were already at. It made no sense to me to tear it down. And an energy, an energy ecosystem, it makes no sense. Why, why don't you power wash it, clean it up, rethink it, and now you have a building that will surely know what it's me because every piece of concrete is a foot thick. So, so when you think about it now, a green roof, these columns were designed to, to handle a six-story building. They only built two. So I had the load bearing capacity built into it by my, well, this one's a no-brainer. I had to pay extra for the, the, the roof material site. And so we're wrapping it up right away. But with that being said, those are the things that take advantage of what has been given to you. And so why not? And so, yes, you have to think about it. And no, it isn't easy. And you can't do simple calculus, frankly, because nobody built buildings like this. But with that being said, I'm, I'm really pleased with the outcome. I'm excited about the potential of having it be a, an asset for the community and for you guys to figure out really cool things to do with it when you graduate, okay? So that's your guys' job. My job is just to create an asset. Your guys is to transform the world. So I, I like simple. I think that's pretty fair, don't you? So there. Uh, is that, has that been helpful to give you guys some perspective? I do 
do hope that someday people will move out of our neighborhood because we've empowered them socially and economically to get out of the shelters and move beyond subsidized housing. Hopefully the you know new wonderful housing opportunities. But I don't, you know, that that is a component you want to think a lot about the economics of translating economic and social benefit into the area around us. And I think the last so I have some I have some slides that you know, where we looked at Earth Day. This was a really creative project. We worked with three different schools to do rain activated artwork. It's temporary. It was just something, you know, fun to drop interest. All of the images and stencils that were created had some historical significance um, to the Studebaker plant. And uh, it was wonderful. We worked with 12, 12 different community organizations to install the rain activated artwork in parts of the district. Um, the other thing, we are a huge supporter of South Bend Code School. They um, operate inside the Immunization Technology Center uh, with um, their code legion. They'll be doing summer coding programs. Uh, but there is a huge skills gap. And uh, we are definitely looking to, for ways to empower organizations um, to help close that skills gap. And South Bend Code School has a particular commitment to teaching web development skills to underrepresented minorities. And they are doing an incredible, incredible job of it. So it's a really, like it's a partnership that we're really proud of. Um, and this is just a few images from our job fair and our partnership with um, places like Code Ministries and Monroe Circle Community Center. So um, those are just like a, a, little, a tiny snapshot of some of the fun projects that I get I get to work on in addition to working with brilliant people like Kevin and um, a lot of the tech companies that are in our environment right now are just, uh, it's just incredible to see the work that they're doing. So. You can see, we picked it because it was on the wrong side of the track. So for instance, we're looking at planting poplars along the road to cleanse the railroad. And what I really ideally would like, I've already worked with the crossings to clear the embankment. But what I'd like to do is to have a homeless actually plant trees. Because how cool would it be? You drive in, now this is about a mile long. So you drive in and you have a green beltway, a gateway, and you know that every tree was planted by a homeless person at that point. Because now they, they literally can, I want them to say that they, they actually belong. They planted the tree, they can look back at it. But that's how that whole ecosystem really works. So, you know, I, I think it's been a challenge, but a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so again, hopefully it uh, makes some sense. It's obviously a lot to cover in a bit of time. Um, so there you go.